Welcome to the One Big Idea Podcast, your guide to making it in Web3. Each week, I sit down with the brightest founders, creators, and thought leaders to unpack the lessons, strategies, and trends you need to know for venturing into the world of crypto. This episode is brought to you by Rock Radio, the world's largest decentralized media company changing the way creators build, distribute, and own their content. To learn more about this creator's first community, visit Rug Radio at www.rug.fm. All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of One Big Idea. We are joined today by the incomparable Troy Carter, someone who I have gotten to know over the past three years, has become a dear friend and mentor. And so it's a real privilege to have you on today. Troy, how are you doing? I am great. So so proud of you. Um, excited to do this. Yeah, let's let's dive in. So, for those that don't know, Troy is an industry, a music industry legend, uh, having previously managed people like Lady Gaga, John Legend. He's built multiple companies. Um, he's now working as the co-founder of Venice, which we'll dive into. But Troy, I'd like to take it back to the beginning. You, know, you grew up uh, in Philadelphia. Tell me what that experience was like. Uh, my understanding is you, know, you, you didn't have the uh, you didn't have the means of, of many people in, in Philadelphia. And so what, what was it like growing up there? Uh, I think gr- growing up in Philly, it was like a very formative um, uh, situation where I feel like that whole idea about being born at in the right place at the right time um, is, is really true when it comes to me growing up in Philadelphia, um, during like the, the, the eighties was like this, the sort of sweet spot. And the reason why I say that is because, um, it was the sort of the birth of hip hop music was happening around that, around that same time. Um, you had the, this cultural revolution with, uh, DJing block parties, uh, break dancing, um, fashion. And, you know, we haven't seen a real shift like that since like, probably like the Harlem Renaissance, when you saw like fashion and music and art and all of these things sort of taking a generational shift. And so that that shift had a huge imprint on me as a kid growing up and me wanting to be a part of that culture. So it's like, so I was born sort of native to that culture and felt like um, it, it was it was my first real sense of belonging. Um, what was to, to hip hop culture? Yeah. So, how did you dive into hip hop culture? You've talked about in the past how you know you weren't you maybe you weren't like nerdy enough for the the nerd kids, but you weren't cool enough for the cool kids. But you really seem to like lean into this hip hop culture and, and the hustle mentality of hip hop culture. What what was that like growing up? It, it was amazing, you know, um, it, literally walking out of my, my, my front door, you know, you sort of walked into the culture. You know, it was a guy down the street named Lawrence Goodman um, who started a record label called um, Pop Art Records. And he had signed Roxanne Chante, MC Shan, um, a, a bunch of different acts, Biz Markey. So a lot of the early, some of the early New York pioneers were signed to this label that you know basically was down the street from 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 my house, and so seeing Lawrence, you know, drive up in his Nissan Pathfinder with like the rims, and like you know he would have on like the 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 fly fila sweatsuit, and uh and it like you, everybody in the neighborhood wanted to be Lawrence, so you know that idea of modeling. Um, and seeing a role model was like sort of right in front of your face of sort of what you wanted to be. And um, so that it, it was it was right there in front of me. And I knew right away, like I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do, but I knew I wanted to be a part of it. Yeah. So pretty early on, you decided that you wanted to to be in a band or in a, in a rap group. Is that is that correct? Yeah, I, I, I did everything from throwing parties to DJing yeah. to, you know, I, I, I had a rap group and like, um, I, I, like anything you could think of, like that was sort of in, in, in hip hop, I played around with it and, and was a part of it. But like um, me and my best friend in ninth grade, you know, that was like, I was more of an introvert. And so um, 
when I, when I met my best friend, he was more of an extrovert and, you know, he was a rapper and we formed this rap group with his cousin. And he was like the first person that sort of taught me about like thoughts becoming things and that, you know, and he, he used his superpowers for girls. Like that was his thing. He, like, <laughs> <laughs> he, would, he, he would use manifestation to get girls. <laughs> and, and um, but, you know, it also, also was applicable to like, you know, he said, if we meet Jazzy Jeff and Fresh Prince, they're going to give us a record deal. And uh, and we were actually able to manifest that by going to their studio every day and waiting outside and, and, and finally got a chance to go inside and meet those guys after however many weeks. But like, you know, meeting him kind of gave me that confidence of, hold on, you know, if you if you really put your mind to something and you put the work in, you know, it could, it could really happen. Yeah. And, and paint the picture here for folks because, you know, Jazzy Jeff and Fresh Prince were like the people in Philadelphia at the time. Is that correct? Like everyone was trying to get a deal with Will Smith. Like this was right at the beginning of like the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, correct? Yeah, this was like the top of Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. And, you know, where in Philly, what was interesting, you had, you know, it was these kids that sang that went to creative and performing arts that started a group and um, we used to see them at talent shows and things like that. And they, they, they were boys to men. And then our friend who worked at city blue um, clothing store and, you know, she used to make these outfits. She ended up moving to Atlanta. And one day we turned on the TV and she's singing in this group called TLC. And it was, it was left eye. And then you had, you know, guys who grew up a few blocks away um, who became Jazzy Jeff and Fresh Prince. And at that time was probably one of the biggest rap groups in the world. And Will was the first rap artist to become a, a, a television star. So, you know, us thinking about meeting Will Smith was like meeting Tom Cruise or, you know, somebody, you know, on, on that level. But we didn't have a plan B or, you know, or any sort of thing where, okay, we're going to go to college and, you know, get degrees or anything like that. This was about, you know, we're going to meet this guy to try to change our lives. And how old were you when, when you met him? I think I was probably 17 or probably 17 or 18 when I met Will. Got it. And so you get signed. How does that go? It's, you know, it, I remember... We, we were in front of the studio, a guy let us in that we knew, and we, we told Will we had this whole routine we wanted him to see. So it was like six guys with him, and we go back outside, and we do this full routine where, like, dancing, everything else, in the snow, like, <laughs> <laughs> it's freezing. And so we go in, we play the demo tape, and I think they were just so amused by us. Like, like these guys really ha- must have some balls to like come and actually do this. And he said, how, how are you guys getting home? And we said, we, we don't know. We're going to probably just take the train. And he gave us a ride home and basically told, you know, one of our aunts that, you know, she, she was like shocked opening up the door and seeing, you know, Will Smith right there, but that um he had us from here and that you know basically these guys are good we're going to change their lives and although it didn't work out in music um uh, he kept to his word and and gave me the opportunity to work at the company and you know I worked for his manager James Lassiter as an assistant worked at Jazzy Jeff studio um as a studio manager and you know helped carry records for Jeff and like whatever he needed and you know true to his word, you know, it, they gave me the ability to change my life. Yeah. And so the, you get signed, the, the deal itself, like doesn't work out on the music side, but you decide to go work for James Lasseter and you move out to LA. How long are you out there working for James? What was that experience? Like, I imagine like being uprooted from Philadelphia to, to moving to LA was a bit of a culture shock. Yeah. You know, um, it was, I, rem- I remember the day that we got dropped from the record label and it was probably um, one of the worst days, you know, of, of my life at that particular time. And I remember being in tears in my grandmother's room on the phone as, you know, we were listening to the fact that the record label was going to drop us. 
And, you know, I felt this sense of, of, of failure and, um, and really didn't know sort of where to go from there. And for months, I kept reaching out to Will and, and, and his manager, James, and, um, and I didn't hear back from them. And, and it was for months. And at first I was like angry about it. Like, you know, cause I felt, you know, abandoned and let down and, but I didn't let the anger, uh, I wasn't overcome with the anger. And I just literally channeled that and start promoting parties and, um, and little shows here and there in the neighborhood. And because I wanted to stay in music, I was, was excited about it. And um, that's when I started promoting shows and I promoted like Wu-Tang shows and I promoted, you know, shows with Biggie and, you know, and some other people and um, and ended up that turned into promoting a show for Biggie is what turned into an internship for Puffy at Bad Boy. And then um, and then following the Bad Boy internship is then when I went to work for for Will and James. Got it. So bad boy happened in between. In between. Understood. Yeah. And so if I if I if memory serves me correctly, Biggie didn't show to that uh show that you promoted for him, correct? No, nah, Biggie Biggie was a no <laughs> show. Yeah, Biggie Biggie was a no show. And um and it's you know, it just goes to the thing where, you know, you don't let anger, you know, um get in the way of 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 logic and opportunity. And, you know, although I was pissed off, you know, because I had sold tickets and I had, you know, a sold out show and all, all of the other acts showed up, but Biggie was the headliner and um, he got stuck in New York shooting a big Papa video and, you know, Puff and those guys ended up making it down super late. The show was over and, um, and it was an after party that, that we were having. And I got a chance to talk to Puffy at the after party and um, his GM, Kirk, ended up giving me, giving me this job as this intern. And, um, you know, Puff was like just the guy at that time. And, um, and so it was a, ma- it was a masterclass and hustle, you know, being able to watch Puff work and learn, learn from the best. And how, how long were you working with, with Puff? Uh, I probably was at bad boy for probably, probably a little over a year and a half or so. Wow. And what, what were you doing for him while you were there? everything taking out trash yeah. um, in the mail room running errands um being on their street team um and that sort of led into being able to work closely with uh kirk burroughs his, his uh puffy's gm at the time and you know being able to learn about marketing being able to learn about a and r being able to sort of l- learn about every single area of the company and I just had this attitude, you know, I, I was commuting from Philadelphia to New York for the internship and I wasn't getting paid. So it's like, if I was going to go and make this investment of my $15 ticket on Peter Pan Trailways back and forth, it was, I got to get the most out of this. I got to be the first person to get there. I got to be the last to leave. And I never forget the first day of the internship, I'm sitting in the mail room. And is another intern. He's he's on the phone, and um, and Puff walks past the mailroom, and he he doubles back and he says, he's telling the intern, get the fuck off the phone. And the intern's like, I'm on, you know, like telling him I'm on the phone. Puff said, get the fuck off the phone. And so he starts laying into this intern about being on a personal call while he's in his, while he's in his office. And when I say he lit into him, he lit into him. And then he made the intern, um, uh, write out the, the, uh, phone book, the yellow pages. No way. Yeah. Intern had to write out in hand the yellow pages. That was, that, that was his punishment at the time. So that was first day of work. It was. You mean like he literally by hand wrote by out hand. like individual yellow pages. Yeah, by hand, by hand, by hand. Black oh my and white, gosh. Black and white composition book. And, but what it showed me out of the gate was this guy means business. We're not here <laughs> to play. This is not, this is not a party. This is, this is about, this is about work. 
This is about hustle. And what, what I respected about him was Puff would be the guy who would go out, go to the studio after work. At, he had a studio called Daddy's House. Leave the studio, go to the club, and then be the first person back in the office in the morning. And it was like that, that, that was his culture. And so, and I, so I respected that, but it was a, it just was a lesson of, you know, of, of showing up and expectations. And when you're there, like you're there fully, like yeah. your work ethic, you gotta, you gotta bring it every day. Cause everybody wants that spot. And, and right. there, there weren't college interns in the bad boy program. These are everybody from the bad boy program were, were, were from the streets. So it's like, you know, it, mo- most people didn't have a high school diploma, let alone a, a college education. So it's like, you know, this is this is a real opportunity that a lot of people would want. So if you if you're coming, if you're showing up, you better really, really show up because otherwise you're keeping somebody else's spot warm. 100 percent. And while you were there in that year and a half, did you have any interaction with with Biggie? This was like at the height of his career, right? Yeah, this is this is like height of height height of Big's career. So you know, yeah. a lot of lot of interaction with Big. Um, I ended up doing quite a few shows with Biggie because I was still promoting shows. So you know, he missed that one, but he made up for you know he for, made up for it <laughs> a few others. But you know, our homework a lot of times as interns was you know find Biggie because Big would disappear. He would ghost. So Big might have an interview somewhere or whatever, and you got to call around every hotel in New York trying to figure out. <laughs> Where, where 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 big is it's like a where's waldo like where's biggie where's just trying big? to figure, like scouring the city to figure out where you where he's where he's turned up where's big but when he shows Amazing. up he's showing up big love that so you work with them for a year and a half how do you make the transition from uh interning there to going to work with james yeah, um, James came by my place one day in Philly. He was in he was um, visiting from LA, and um, came and picked me up. And you know, we got to talking, and he basically said, "You know what? Um, there's going to be an opportunity. I need a second assistant. Um, if you fly back to uh, fly to LA with me tonight, he's like, I'm literally flying to LA and I'm coming right back. So we literally this is my first time on a private plane. Uh, uh, fly with James." Um, we stay at his place in Beverly Hills and mind you, I'm living at 157 North Dewey street in Philly, like in the hood hood at that time. Um, you know, I had a one and a half year old son at that, at that time. So I'm like 22 years old or somewhere in that area. Um, and, but it's like, it was, it was really, I needed it. Like, because like, li- like w- the way I, the way I was living at that time, um, it was like, I was becoming, um, a, a, a big fish in a very small pond. Like, you know, so where, you know, working at bad boy was like a huge accomplishment coming from where I was, where, where I came from. And people thought like, oh, you made it, you work for Puff. But I wasn't getting a check or anything like that. You know, I, I had a, 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 a son to worry about at that point. And James offered me that opportunity. And, you know, within, you know, a few weeks, you know, I figured out how to get to L.A. And um, uh, found a, a, an apartment that a friend that I knew was she was moving back to New York. And um, I was able to grab her apartment and, um, and I started working for those guys. And what, what did you do when you were working with James? Um, I, being his second assistant, it was everything, running errands, um, getting cars washed, uh, organizing books and bookshelves, alphabetical order, or, uh, organizing CDs and, uh, and listening and, and, and running phone calls. And running phone calls was probably the best job you could ever have as an assistant because your job was to run the phone sheet. And that was, okay, uh, get the head of Sony Studios on the phone. And you get that person on the phone and you listen to the entire conversation. And that, I was, it, 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 was, it was mind-blowing because I would listen to James, who grew up a few blocks away from me, 
on the phone with all of these important people, but where he was just as important though. He managed the biggest movie star in the world. You know, so it's like being able to, um, to, to, to listen in on that and learn about how business is conducted and the subtlety, like, you know, not, not business school 101, but like, how do you talk to, to, to people? Um, how do you build rapport with people? Um, it blew my mind how, you know, they, people, they would talk about their family lives way before they even discussed any point of business. It, like it wasn't transactional. And, um, and then the questions James would ask about things. So like all of that stuff helped me build um, my, my vocabulary and, and, um, and, and not, not just from a, from a vocabula- vocabulary of words, but like how, how do you understand and approach business? And I just copied a James style. So my, my style ended up being like if – James Lasseter and P. Diddy had a kid. What would that <laughs> what would that kid look like? You know, so it's like it was just a marriage of, of 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 those two styles. Are there any conversations or lessons that stick out to you still to this day from James? Yes. Like so James I, I won I, I won an award. Um uh, <laughs> a few years back and James took out an ad in like the, the book, like where they were honoring me. And, yeah. uh, and what he wrote was, uh, you were the worst assistant, <laughs> but, but, a but turned into a great business person. Something, something along those lines. <laughs> <laughs> kept, kept it real to this day. I mean, we should, we should talk about, uh, your, Internship ended pretty unceremoniously, correct? Uh, you, were, you were fired. He fired, <laughs> yeah. fired me. It sent me sent me back to Philly because I like I was so I was so unfocused and I was like I wanted to do everything. Like I wanted to do everything. I still wanted to promote. I was still promoting shows in Philly. Um, I was still doing like tr- trying to figure out artists to manage. I wanted to do everything you could think of I wanted to do. So I was super unfocused and I would do dumb stuff. Like I would take, they had a golf cart um, because we were on a set of, um, our offices were, it was on a set of Universal Studios, um, uh, California. And so, you know, Steven Spielberg's Amblin Entertainment was there. Um, You had like, Every like so many major uh, movie producers had their offices on Universal Studios, so I would just take the golf cart and go to people's offices and like, <laughs> <laughs> like it just was like, I, I you I, I, I would have fired me way faster than James would have d- did fire me, but you know I took I used to use this car service um, to go see my girlfriend in Long Beach. And, um, and, uh, but at the end of the week, I would, I would get my paycheck and I would pay for the car service with the GM of the company. I would say, Hey, you know, here's my reimbursement. So she knew I was using it. And, um, she got mad at me one day and told James and he flipped his lid and he fired me. But what he said to me was, um, I, I took the opportunity for granted. And that I was a jack of all trades and a master of none. And that if I wanted to be successful, I would try, I would have to figure out something to master. And I was insulted. <laughs> like, <laughs> how dare, how dare he say this to me? Um, but he was right. But he was right. And it took me, you know, uh, uh, probably a couple years before I figured out how right he was. And I didn't speak to him during that couple of, couple of years. And I, you know, w- had a lot of resentment because I felt like he forgot where he came from and he turned his back on me and all of these things. But what I realized was that, you know, I did I did take the opportunity for granted. And um, and I was all over the place. But him firing me was one of the best things that could have ever happened to me. But, you know, nothing wakes you up like cold concrete. 
And um, it was super humbling to have to go back to Philly after, you know, I, you know, had this big job and, you know, and, uh, and I'm in Hollywood and now I got to explain to everybody, you know, why, why I'm back home. Yeah. So tell me about going back home. What, what were your next steps after, you know, having to go back and face your, your friends and family? How did you pick yourself back up off the mat? Yeah, I, I remember like the week before I left California to go back to Philly, um, it was like I could I could barely get out of bed and um, and just remember it just being super, super dark. And um, and when I went back, I didn't have a plan of what I what I was going to do. Um, went back and, you know, was trying to figure out, you know, what was still happening in the city that I could get involved in. And, um, and a friend of mine, he, he, had, uh, he had told me, he was like, Oh, call your cousin Mark. They're, you know, they're doing, um, uh, this thing called black Friday and it was a promotions company and, and a management company. And Mark, you know, brought me on board to help them figure out and how to navigate certain things because they, they needed a GM. And so um, I came on board and I started helping those guys out. And, um, and you know, that, that uh, you know, I love those guys for the opportunity, but it just wasn't, um, I, I came from like a lot of structure working with Will and those guys. And, um, and you know, truth be told, it was, a, a, you know, these guys were from the streets, you know, um, you know, some of the, some of the, the partners in the company and like, and when I say from the streets, like really from the streets, like, you know, yeah. and, um, and, and it was certain things happening in the company and specifically um, one of the artists that we were managing um, you know, he was on Rockefeller and he came in the office one day and, um, and he pulled out a gun on one of the partners and, um, and, and started shooting and somebody, and I, I wasn't in the office and somebody called me up and they're like, Troy, we got, you know, I'm getting out of here. And, you know, and that was like one of the, that was like the last straw for me on, on that. And I left. And, um, and shortly after Eve left and Eve called me up and asking me to help her figure out a, a manager or whatever. And, um, and that sort of turned into me managing Eve. Wow. So you both leave a pretty terrible situation. This becomes like you being a first time manager. How did you learn on the fly, uh, as you're managing Eve, who it would, would grow to like become a superstar at the time? Um, you know, a lot of it was, you know, like I said, being able to learn um, vocabulary from James, you know, was super helpful. Being able to work for Puffy and, and watch watch him was super helpful. And then I really genuinely loved Eve. And like, you know, she she was like a sister, like we became super close. So um, so I think the instinct of protecting her and made me really want to learn the business and really understand it. And like, you know, she, she, she knew she had a protector on her side. So I think, you know, that sort of drove me to ask all of the right questions. Um, I was incredibly humble when it came down to like picking people's brains and being honest about what I didn't know. And um, Chris Lighty, you know, God rest his soul. You know, Chris was the founder of Violator, one of the best managers of, of all time. Uh, probably the number one manager in the history of hip hop. Um, and Chris and his partner, Todd Moskowitz and Mona uh, Scott, they let me have an office in their office in New York. So I used to hang up there all the time and I got a chance to learn from no, those guys and watching Mona Scott, she was managing Missy and Busta Rhymes at the time. Um, Chris Lighty was managing, you know, Tribe Called Quest, LL Cool J, um, uh, Noriega, uh, Neptunes, like all of these great bands. And, um, and so I was able to learn like in real, real, real time while Eve was coming up and, you know, and that helped me structure her thing to help her become a star. And so as Eve is coming up, this is when you create, uh, your first management company, correct? Yes. Um, I created, uh, it was, it's a company called 
originally it was Boy Wonder when it was just me. And then yeah. I met um, one of my closest friends now, Jay Irving. Um, and we, we sort of merged our, he had, he managed an act named Flower Tree out of London. I was managing Eve. And then we merged the two companies together and created Irving Wonder. And then from there, we just, you know, we signed a bunch of acts together and, and sort of built from there. Yeah. And what, what were some of the early lessons of building? This is your first company that you're, you're building with someone. Uh, what were some of the, the challenges that maybe you didn't anticipate? Um, Honestly, it was, we had, we had a lot of fun. <laughs> we had a lot of fun because we had no clue what we were doing. You know, we like, it, it was, you know, we, we had to figure out an office. We needed to be downtown because you were important. If you were downtown, the cheapest thing was under the steakhouse. So it was like a basement office that like nobody else wanted and, you know, we took over this office and that became a center of gravity in Philadelphia because so many acts would come through there. You know, people wanted to hang out there. And, you know, um, Jay Irvin, who, who was my partner and still one of my closest friends to this day, we would go out and eat dinner every, you know, together every day, you know, hang out, like go to basketball games, go to sporting events. And so culturally, we didn't it wasn't a thing like we never heard the word about building company culture back then. It just happened naturally because we genuinely loved each other. We loved the artists that we were working with. Everybody who we hired sort of was under the same sort of um, uh, ethos that, you know, that, that we had. And, you know, we made a ton of mistakes. You know, when, when we went to sell that company, you know, we sold the company after like five years. And, you know, I remember... I remember when I, you know, I got approached by um, uh, Sanctuary to to sell the company, and they gave me the, you know, we, you know, talked a bit, and they came to me, uh, you know, a couple weeks later, and they said, okay, we just want to buy uh, your half of the company because um, we want you to come on board and and run Urban Music for us and. Um, and so, you know, this is what we want to do. And it became a very easy decision because I, I said, it's either me and Jay or nothing. And that to me is what a real partnership is about. And those, cause those things get tested because that was more money than I ever seen in my life at that particular time. And, um, but my relationship and my, and, my, and my brotherhood was more important than any opportunity that, that they could ever offer me. And so that's what our culture built and that's what our friendship built. And for me, that's the ethos that I took with me throughout the rest of my career and, and through all the other companies that I built along the way was can I have uh, partnerships with people um, and relationships with people in the company where, um, where it holds that much weight. And so they end up coming back and, and saying, okay, correct. Like they buy the entire company. Yeah, they bought, they bought the entire company. And, um, and what's funny is, you know, as you talk about lessons, you know, they said, okay, you got to open up, you got to send up, send over the, um, due diligence to, this is everything that we need. And we didn't even know what due diligence was. No exaggeration. <laughs> I had never heard the term due diligence before. <laughs> never heard the term before. And um, and then so, and working in hip hop back then, it was all cash because you didn't trust promoters in other places. So this is before Live Nation was doing these organized tours. So it would be, homeboy 101 promoting your show in memphis and it's like okay i never heard of you before um i need you to um send me uh x amount up front that you know you can send me that by wire but i'm picking up cash when i come before i get on the stage and right. and you would go backstage and you would do the count backstage all cash and and so when it came time to diligence they're like okay where's the like 
how's this work? And we had to explain like, okay, you get hip hop's a di- very different business and this is how it works. And this is why, you know, this looks like this or whatever. And, um, and they basically said, okay, we'll still buy the company, but it no longer works that way. <laughs> We're a publicly traded company. You guys got to level up now. And so we figured, you know, from there, it's like we had to figure out, okay, you know what? We got to, we have to grow the business up now. So not only do we have to mature as executives, um, we also have to um, have, have, have our business acumen uh, uh, mature as well. Right. And so they buy the company. You move out to LA again, correct? Yep. Moved out to LA. Yeah. And how, how long were you working with them? Uh, sanctuary for two years. And, um, yeah. And probably after six months, I knew that I made a terrible mistake because I, I, I just was not having fun anymore. And well, yeah. What was it about it that, that made you realize that it wasn't, it wasn't the right fit? It just was a disconnect from, it was a disconnect from what I was used to in terms of me being in it with the artists, me being in it with my partner every day. It just was like, like that, like that's, that's when you, when, when you really learn about culture, by the way, you know, and you could kind of see a clear difference between something being super corporate and something being, you know, all about like money versus the, the real love of what you do. Um, you know, the beauty of it was, um, you know, the, the CEO was a, a really brilliant guy and still brilliant. Um, uh, Merck, who started hypn- hypnosis, was the CEO of Sanctuary. No way. Yeah, Merck bought my company. And um, wow. and Matthew Knowles... Um, was ran ran uh, black music for them essentially. So Matthew was the person who brought me brought me in, and so learning from Matthew, who had the biggest act, you know, with Destiny's Child at that particular time, and then Merck had Guns and Roses and Elton John and like you know huge 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 acts. It just was like it showed me how big the world was geographically as I'm looking at like tour, tour itineraries, uh, looking at how many records people were actually selling. Like, you know, I was selling a lot of records, by the way, but they were selling a lot of records. And so that was like a masterclass. So, you know, so I, I was able to learn a lot, but at the same time, I just I just felt like um, my, 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 my soul was not, was just, wasn't in it. My soul wasn't in it. Got it. And so how did you exit? What was, what was next after Sanctuary? Um, We, we ended up, um, funny enough, me, me, me and one of the guys in finance were were super close. And, um, and I approached them. I'm like, you know, what would it take for me to buy the company back? Uh, You know, I want to go back on my own. And he said, well, Give it some, give it a little bit of time and they might not even be able to make payroll to pay you. So, like, <laughs> so this all might work out in your favor anyway. So, um, and, wow. and it did. So it's like, you know, so, so it, we ended up being able to, uh, figure out a way to get out of, uh, out of the contract and, um, and being able to walk with the, with the talent as well. And I started, um, my, my, my new company, at first it was called Coalition Media Group. That, you know, that was the name of the company. And, you know, Eve, Eve, you know, and I left and I opened up my office on like Wilshire Boulevard in, in LA. Like they have like the fanciest office I could find. And I'm like, okay, we're going to crush it. And then, uh, and then I ended up getting fired by, by Eve. And, uh, and that sort of like changed everything. You know, so, and, you know, she she just wanted to go into another direction and, and looking at like Queen Latifah's career and like, you know, some of the big, big, big stars, 
like she was looking to push into that area. And at that time, I, I hadn't had that under my belt yet to be able to accomplish that. And I think she felt like she needed somebody to help get her to the next level. So just to paint the picture for everyone, you get out of your agreement with Sanctuary. You just go and sign a lease on a new office building. You're going to start this big company. A very expensive lease, too, by the way. A very expensive lease uh, in a great part of town. I assume you're only working with Eve at this point, right? So like yeah, when she yeah. when she leaves, like you're literally starting over, but even worse, like you're starting over with all these expenses. So how did you how did you get through that? Um, barely, you know, um, yeah. put it, the only thing I had left after that entire situation was probably breath in my lungs and my family, you know? And, um, and, and what I mean by that is that, um, I literally had spent pretty much the money I made from the sale in a big scheme of things after taxes after you know buying our uh, buying a house, expenses, opening up the new office, hiring a new employee and new employees, and all of those things, um, I didn't have any money. So I was sort of dependent on. I was playing the futures game of okay, you know, this is what we have coming up. This is what we're gonna do. And so when when um, when she let me go. I wasn't prepared for it. And so I ended up having to move out of that office and still owed the money on the lease. Um, still owed, you know, all of the bills that had, had, had uh, um, compiled over that period of time. And then that sort of, you know, turned into personal expenses, you know, so get, got behind on like mortgage and car notes and, um, tuitions and taxes and like, you know, all of those things. And it got to the point where I couldn't, I, I, I didn't know what I was going to do. Um, I had never been dep- a person that was like depressed. And that was when I realized what depression was, by the way. And, and like, you want to talk about like not knowing what you're going to do, not being, not having a clue how to figure it out, figure it out. Um, you know, it was like going into 2008. So it's like, you couldn't even borrow money from nobody during the, you know, cause that was like during the financial crisis. So, so it's not like banks had money to lend. It's not like friends had money to even borrow at that, at that time, everybody was a bit scared and, you know, that, that just was probably, you know, one of the toughest times in my, in my adult life, having to live through fear, um, shame, embarrassment, um, confusion. And I, I just remember very, very clearly driving down Ventura Boulevard and, um, and pulling over and breaking down, like crying in my car. And because it's just like everything had hit me at that time. Like it just was like a ton of bricks. And you, I'm not like, this is when you question like, do I even want to live? Like, you know, is it easier for me to not be here? Like those, like, like that's, that's real shit. Like when you like, and, you know, but I had kids, you know, my family, my mom, like, you know, like people like really depend on me and I'm like almost left alone to like really try to figure, figure this out. And, um, but that, that moment was sort of like that to me, if like, if anybody could ever pinpoint like, okay, what was rock bottom? Like yeah. sitting in front of McDonald's on Ventura Boulevard um, in my driver's seat crying, that was rock bottom for me. Um, and from there, you know, a friend, you know, Vincent Herbert had introduced me to, to um, 
to this artist Gaga that he had found. Um, he brought her in from New York and like, you know, and I met her and, um, you know, she had just gotten dropped from her record label and she was like incredibly talented. And that was like, okay, I got somebody who I'm inspired by. And, and with Vincent, I had somebody who believed in me. Like, cause a lot of times when you're down, you just need somebody that believes in you. You know, like I, I always say, just put the battery in my back, you know, like, cause like that little thing of somebody just saying, like, remember who you are, I believe in you, or just offering a hand of friendship just goes so far. And, and that was a bit of a recharge for me. And, you know, slowly but surely, you know, like it was this little things like I learned meditation from a friend of mine who introduced me to a guy that taught meditation at this little apartment in Westwood that was life changing for me. And, you know, I did like a little three day intensive thing with him and like as a living room with like eight strangers, like, you know, the weirdest thing you could possibly think of, of. And it was like it was transformational. You know, I learned, you know, about breath work. And this is, you know, 2008. This is before yeah. like meditation had really become a thing and people didn't talk about mindfulness and things like that. And it's like, so it was a little bit like weird and like it left the center and you didn't want to talk about it openly, but it was so helpful in terms of me being able to remove myself from the problem and understand that I wasn't the problem. You know, it, it's like, because a lot of times, like when we start like just blaming ourselves and we get down on ourselves and like, you know, we, we'll, we, we treat ourselves worse than our worst enemy sometimes. Like if we listen to our mental chatter, it's like, so being able to get back into at least a clear headspace and then to be able to call all of my, everybody who I owed money to and just like, you know, whether I was emailing them or calling them just to say, hey, I don't have it right now, but, um, you know, when I get it, I'm going to send it. I didn't forget about it and because I, I refuse to file bankruptcy because I'm like, I want to pay the people that I owe. I'm not going to file bankruptcy. I want to pay the people that I owe. And that was important to me. And, um, and, and the other piece of it, too, was um, being humble, like, I had to really be able to um, not let anger overtake me and not let um, the situation with Eve make me bitter. And like, you know, um, how, how can it make me better instead of bitter and, and, and channel that energy. And even down to, I saw my, my old assistant, she, Leah, who's like fantastic. Leah worked for me for, for free. Like when I, when I couldn't pay her, she worked for me for free. And like, she really helped me develop Gaga in the beginning and, um, and was very instrumental. And I saw her last, last week and she was saying, Troy, remember when you took the, the job at Comedy Central when you didn't have any money? And, and I said, I, said oh, I forgot about that because they, they needed a consultant because Chappelle had left. And I knew some of the people there and they called me up one day and uh, probably because of the, I might be the only black guy that they knew. And they're like, <laughs> <laughs> they're like, we need to find somebody to, to replace Chappelle. And so, um, you know, Troy, can you help? Can you consult us on on uh, comedy? And so literally for a year while I was developing Gaga, I was consulting Comedy Central on on their comedy sleep. Like it's, but it was like, what am I going to say? No, like, you know, it, like I got to figure out how to, how to pay the bills right now. Yeah. And it, to your point of staying humble and yep. finding opportunities and staying, staying in the fight. One of the guys from Comedy Central, I, I ran into him recently. He said, Troy, I never forget. He's like, every time you would come up to our office, you would have your backpack and you would leave a stack of these um, CDs with this crazy looking girl on, um, the, re on the reception desk and stuff. So people could take the CDs and it was like the Gaga CDs. I used to carry them everywhere and like give them out to people. But he was like, he was like, it's crazy because we would look at you like this guy is just nuts. 
And it's like, but you know, for, for that to turn into what it turned into. Wow. That, that reminds me of in the Kanye doc when Kanye is like going to Rockefeller and he's playing, playing his, his CD for everyone. And everyone's like, what are you doing? Like, like get, get out of here. But it takes that, like a lot of people aren't willing to go to that level. Like you've got to hustle more than you've ever hustled. Like you have to be at, at this is you can kind of speak to some advice for artists, but the willingness to go above and beyond to promote yourself when no one else believes like to have that conviction and continually show up is not an easy thing. It's an uncomfortable thing to continue to do that day in and day out. Yeah. Cause you know, like a lot of times, you know, pride gets in the way of a uh, progression and it's like, you, you know, you don't, you, you don't want to, pe- a lot of people don't want to put themselves out there to be told no or, or to be embarrassed or, you know, things along those lines. And the reality is it's like, you're going to be told no. You're going to be embarrassed, you know, you, but if you feel like you got the goods, you got to you got to go out there and, and, and show the world that you got the goods. And, and and a lot of times, too, it's just like for me, th- th- it, I was just so passionate about her as an artist. I wanted everybody to hear how good it was. And I'm like, because if people hear it, they're going to understand how good this is. And, you know, every artist should have a manager just as passionate as, 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 as I was about, about her. But like, that's just me with, with, I'm like a dog on a bone when I, when I get excited about something, I want everybody to know about it. Yeah. And to that end for aspiring managers, what lessons do you take away from both developing Eve and, and Lady Gaga and, and others in the future? I mean, it seems like it was all engrossing. Like there is no separation of personal life and business life. Like this was your life all, all around the clock. Yeah. You, you know, is, is, is one of the reasons why I left management as well. Uh, it was one of the reasons why I was a really good manager. And then it was, is one of the reasons why I left management, <laughs> you know, um, I was all in, and I was incredibly passionate about the artists that I worked on. And I was on the road with them. I, you know, I, I lived it, breathed it, was, you know, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, and, and, and it is incredibly, it's great for the, for, for, for the artists. It, it was great for my business. It was great for me to build my career. It sucks for a family. <laughs> That's the reality. It sucks right. for the family. And um, and initially, there were sacrifices that I had to make because this is how bills got paid. This is how kids stayed in school and all of those things. And as I grew as a manager and as the business did well, and as I started doing more well in life, um, and you know, I have, we have five kids, and it's like our two older ones – they live through me not being home a lot. And then, you know, we have two that's like in the middle that, um, and with those two, um, it's like the two older ones were there when I, when I was managing Eve and I was just getting started. The two after were when, um, I started working with, with, with Gaga and around, around that time. And then my youngest was when I, I, I wasn't doing management at all. So, you know, my, my two in the middle, they, it, they got a chance, you know, because I'm like, I can't, I don't, I'm starting to see myself miss out on important moments in my kid's life. And I don't, I, I can't do that again. And sometimes that's hard for artists to understand when you're not going to be there every day. And the reality is I built an organization where I didn't have to be there every day. But artists pay managers a lot of money and they want to see you every day, you know, for the most for the most part. And there was an inflection point. I remember when it was my my son's first soccer game and it was some event at the White House. And I'm like, I'm going to my son's soccer game. Like, there's, there is only going to be one first soccer game. And if I'm really good at what I do, 
I'll be able to get invited to the White House again. But I'm not missing the soccer game. And there's moments where it's like sort of tr- you start tr- having to figure out trade offs. And then later, what I realized was, and this is, you know, towards the end of me doing management, that it wasn't even fair to artists anymore, that I just wasn't as passionate. Like, I couldn't give them what I gave Gaga and Eve. Like, and artists deserve that. Like, I want every artist to have have, have that. And honestly, you know, when people came in for me to make, like, you know, they would come to our company and say, hey, we want management. They Their expectation was, I want you to be there with me or, I, you know, I want to be the biggest star in the world. And I'm coming to you because of everything that you've done in the past. And I just didn't have that to give to them anymore. Yeah, they were coming for Troy Carter. They were, they were coming for the Troy Carter experience. So you're getting dad. Right, right. And, and that must have been, I mean, it, it just comes down to priorities and, and shifting, you know, where, where it's important for you to be. I would imagine that also had a large influence in the types of businesses you decided to build later on with Adam Factory and then moving into to Venice. Um, you want to talk a little bit about first about Adam Factory and then we can we can talk a little bit about Venice before we wrap up. Yeah, you know, Adam Adam Factory turned out to be um, almost like my my dream company. Like if if I can if if I was a kid and I could figure out you know how to build the company, it, you know, it was it was Adam Factory. And um, reason being, it's it was it w- it was a bunch of great artists combined with a bunch of great ideas. So, you know, the business was built around talent management, but then, you know, we launched a a brand agency and did a lot of work with great brands. Um, I started doing early stage technology investing and started investing in some great, great, great startups. And, um, you know, we had clients that were launching like fragrances and clients that are launching clothing lines and all different types of products. So we became almost like this sort of idea factory. And, um, and, 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 and it felt um, progressive versus, you know, anything traditional talent management companies w- were doing at the time or what, you know, record labels were, were actually doing. So, um, so, so Adam Factory was just, you know, sort of a culmination of like, you know, great, great, great ideas. It was like sort of our version of what, um, sort of imagineering would have been, but in talent management. I love that. And, you know, I'm always fascinated by the investing side. We've had plenty of conversations to that end because I've, I've always found it so refreshing that a lot of people in entertainment don't necessarily understand the opportunity that they have to invest. And you not only talk, took it upon yourself to invest for yourself, but like give these opportunities to artists. Where, where did that passion for investing come from and who were some of those like first early companies that you invested in? I would say the, the, it didn't start off as a passion for investing. Um, it actually was more curiosity around um, Silicon Valley and, um, and entrepreneurial culture. And so, you know, I got introduced to a couple of people in Silicon Valley and automatically I was sort of fascinated just by this sort of counterculture that, that they were building. And I got really lucky because, you know, one of the first people I met in the Valley was um, was Joe Lonsdale, and he, who Joe, you know, was a protege of, of Peter Thiel's. Um, Joe, uh, he's currently the founder of 8VC, but and Adapar, and um, and a bunch of other great companies. And being able to spend time with Joe and um, one of his mentors, Matt Mickelson, and um, and a few others, it just showed me what scale and big ideas look like. It showed me what collaboration looked like. It showed me what um, what what uh, simplicity looks like and in, in, um, in terms of structure. 
So like with the music business, the music business is um, all sizzle, no steak. It's all about the flash and, and the look. And so, you know, you're driving the craziest cars, you see people with jewelry, private jets, like, you know, it's all about like, you know, this, 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 how, how you, the image you project. And going up there and seeing people in like hoodies and t-shirts and like Priuses and like, you know, just, you know, little apartments and, you know, simple offices, but yet they were building these, you know, companies of tomorrow it just showed me like, hold on, we may be doing this wrong. Like, you know, like how, how should we be looking at this? And I just started spending time up there and I would go up three days a week. I would commute. I would, I would jump on Southwest flight from Burbank to San Jose um, in the morning. By dinner time, I would be back in, in, in LA. And that was like, my, like a routine. And then I met Bill Maris and David Crane from Google Ventures. And those guys, you know, really showed me about structure of investing and things along those lines. Um, I met a guy named Shervin Pishavar, who introduced me to Uber and, and Warby Parker and a few other companies. And, um, and it just kind of opened up my eyes to, um, to, to this world of, 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 uh, of entrepreneurship. Um, but also, and that's what turned into the world of investing. I didn't do it to make money. You did it out of curiosity. I did it out of curiosity. I did it out of curiosity. And I imagine I a lot of... Money. I didn't do it to lose money. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, I but if nothing else, you were getting an education. Yes, it was, it was all about, you know, the, 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 the education and, and network. It, am I right in that it was during this time that you met Daniel and invested in Spotify as well. Yeah, it was it was during during that same sort of time period. Um, I got a call um, about investing in Spotify first, and they wanted me and a, and, a, and a client to invest. And when the client passed, they said I couldn't invest. And that, I'm like, that I said, hold on, this is so short sighted. Like, and it wasn't Daniel; it was it was somebody else who was um, yeah. who was at the company, and. Um, and so it kind of turned me off from, from Spotify. And this is way before they launched in America. They were just in like a couple of um, small European markets at the time. And somebody, uh, uh, this guy, D.A. Wallach, who um, is a great artist that I knew, he called me up and he's like, you got to meet my friend Shaq, um, Shaquille Khan, who works with Daniel. Um, he wants to help fix this rift that you're having with Spotify. And I met Dan, I met Shaq and um, then I met Daniel and we ended up on this trip in Ethiopia together um, with, a, with a group called Charity Water. And they build like wells and for, um, for, for, for places around the world that um, can't get access to water. And we went over um, on a missionary trip and it was like 25 founders that went over. And spending that, spending that time with Daniel, like, it just, I'm like, this guy, this is a special dude. Like, really, really, like, he, he runs deep. And this guy's 10 years younger than me, by the way. But I'm like, I can learn a lot from this guy. And so I ended up um, investing. I became an advisor to the company for years. Um, was helping them, you know, on some of the stuff and figuring out U.S. strategy and kind of getting artists um, to to on the platform. And then eventually that turned into me going into the company um, when I decided not to do management anymore. Um, I had this opportunity to build out this division called Creator Services for Spotify um, before they went public, and that was like it was good for both of us, you know. Um, Spotify, it, at that time, they didn't have strong relationships and trust with the music industry. So my job was to sort of, you know, how do I build that trust and build that bridge with artists and labels and music publishers and producers um, and, and built a team around that. I built a global team around that. And it was probably one of the best personal and professional experiences I ever had. And, um, 
even down to all of the learnings around the, taking the helping the company go public and you know doing investor presentations it just was fascinating and um and I never went I never went to college before and I never worked for a, a corporation before and it was it was an incredible opportunity great time and um and then after a while it's like you know it starts feeling like a job and I'm like okay right that, <laughs> Time, 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 time to go back out. And so you go back out. You didn't have any plans of immediately starting something, right? But but very quickly, you you decided to to start a company with Susie. Yeah, I went at, when I when I left Spotify. Literally, my first meeting I had when I left, um, I went over to Jimmy Iovine's house, and um, Jimmy's the founder of Beats by Dre and uh, and Interscope Records, and. Um, and I, I was talking to Jimmy about some ideas. He said, Troy, take a year off. He said, you never had the opportunity in your life to take off. Take off Take off for a year before you do anything. And that lasted about, <laughs> the, it, the not do anything lasted for probably a, a month, two months, because I got a call about consulting for the Prince Estate. So it wasn't going to do a, like an official company, but like I can't turn down Prince. So it's like I was consulting for the Prince Estate, and um, so so still doing that. And then I flew to China to meet with Bite Dance um, because I was having uh, discussions with them about um, running music for them for the U.S. For, for, for uh, they were launching. Um, a new company called TikTok. And so that uh, I, I started talking to them about that and took a few meetings. And I'm like, this independent thing has been it, like, I, I've been thinking about this independent music thing for so long. And I, I saw all of the problems that we were having, you know, within Spotify around, you know, being able to do things for independent artists and um, called Susie up. And I'm like, I think I'm going to do this. I think I'm going to do it. And uh, Susie came on board and we've been building from there. Yeah. And it's, I've, I've been fortunate to be part of that building for, for three years and still as, as an advisor to the company and tell, walk me through, you know, where, where you guys are at today with, with Venice music. Yeah, we, um, we ended up, it, it, we took the, we took the, the route. And, I, I have this thing where when somebody tells me not to do something, I want to figure out why I should be doing it. Because <laughs> usually when somebody tells you not to do something, it's, um, it's because it's really hard. And one thing I know for sure is that a lot of people will project their own fears or, or, or their own failures on you. And um, so when people told me not to build software, um, I decided to build software, you know, because a big piece of it was, okay, I can license somebody else's software, but I'm going to be beholden to, to their development process and their roadmap. And if they sell the company to one of my competitors or they sell to a major label, then I'm starting from scratch again, essentially. So, you know, I spent, you know, a good amount of time, you know, hiring an engineering team and building out the software. Then somebody said, um, you know what, you should go through this company, Merlin, to do all of your licenses um, for, for, for your company because it's too hard to do all of these individual licenses with Spotify, Apple, Tencent, like, you know, name all of these streaming companies. And I had this bright kid that, um, that just started working for me that came in from Amazon that I'm like, this kid, super smart. His name was Austin Hurwitz. I said, Austin, <laughs> I want you to go out and get every license from um, from these DSPs, from Spotify, from Amazon, from all of these people. And he said, why should we be doing that? And I, and I told you why. And we ended up saying, okay, let's 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 do it. And you did it. You got, you went out and you got all of our licenses. And for me, it was about because if, if we're going to build the company, we're going to build the company right. And so, and then from there, we went out and we were, we've been able to get on 
a ton of great independent artists on the platform. Um, we launched Venice. Um, it'll be two years in January officially where we launched Venice. Um, we're approaching 2 billion streams on the platform, um, you know, paying out close to almost $10 million to, to, to artists soon. Um, you know, just, and we just launched a subscription business. So where it's like anybody who wants to put out music and join Venice, you know, so, so for me, this is like my real second act because I feel like I spent the first half of my career being able to help, um, individual artists become global superstars and, you know, knowing that that didn't scale but it was super fulfilling and, um, and it made a lot of impact, you know, um, for those artists and for those fans that, that they inspire and for them, uh, for other artists who come behind them. But I really wanted to figure out like, how do we help the underdogs? Like, you know, the, the people who aren't going to get the attention from the major labels, the people who, when they do get attention, um, you know, their, their ownership is taken away from them. Their creative freedom is taken away from them, and um, and almost like their creative spark is, is it gets extinguished. And um, so, being able to put the power back in their hands to help them uh, make money, to help them uh, get access to information of how to build their careers, to help them get access to a community of peers, to help them help put those th- that battery in their backs to kind of say, "Hey, you could do it." Um, to, to, like that to me feels like a mission that other people could, could get, get excited behind. And we got a great team in place and, um, feels really good right now. It's been, it's been wonderful to watch, uh, just seeing the impact that you're having across so many different artists and their teams. What does 2023 look like for Venice moving forward? You know, it's, it's execution is everything. You know, us being able to launch this subscription business, um, and and you know, for me personally, I feel like you know, there's 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 good options out there for independent artists to release music. Um, not a lot of great options, and I I want to be able to give people. Um, if, if I'm looking at December 2024, 2023, and I'm looking back, how many artists said that we made an impact in their careers? Did we make them smarter? Um, were we able to help them network better, find collaborators, find managers, find community? Were we able to help them sell more music? Were we able to help them reach more fans? Um, you know, were we able to help them make money? Like all of those things. Um, I want to be able to look back in, um, the, in the next year and say we made a, a meaningful impact. Honestly, is all about execution. Every day I look at chop wood, carry water. Like, you know, what is it that, that, that we have to do to gain this amount of this, this many more subscribers today? Um, and are we actually making an impact on those subscribers? Um, for the acts that we give services to, are we actually helping them build more fans, get more streams, help them sell more music, help them sell more tickets? So just kind of thinking about impact. But to be honest, Austin, it's like I'm in pure hustle mode right now. Um, this is probably the best headspace that, I, that I've been in um, in a long, long time. Um, I know what's at stake right now. Um, I know the environment that we're in right now, you know, um, just from tech companies and everything else. So, you know, every, everything's important on the flip side of everything being important. I just want to have fun. Like, you know, I, I sent a note to my team and, and a link the, the other day, just, you know, it was an old, um, a old Apple interview with, with, um, with, with, with Steve Jobs. And he was saying how he was talking about passion. And I always talk about passion around the company. And the reason why I always talk about passion around the company, because what we do is fucking hard. What we do can be totally frustrating. What we do can keep you up at night. 
So if you're not passionate and you're not having fun along the way and you're not being able to celebrate and you're not getting joy out of it, you're going to run into a brick wall. And Mm -hmm. for me, I love doing music. I love working with artists. I love mentoring managers. I love like I, I love everything about what we're doing. And so I, I it, so this is easy for me in that sense. Like my, my like my pain tolerance is 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 high because it's like it doesn't feel like pain for me. You know, like because because I, I I get to see the results of the work and I get to see what those tweets are. I get to see what those Instagram posts look like. I get to see artists posting their pictures of their sold out concerts and all of those things. That's my, that's my fuel. And, you know, and that's the fuel that, you know, I'm, I'm hoping gets us through um, the end of next year and coming out super successful in, in the next year. Well, I'm, I'm excited to see you guys continue to develop and, and help so many artists and their teams. Before I let you go, you've been incredibly gracious with your time. Really appreciate it. I ask everyone who comes on for their one big idea. So the one thing that you'd like to leave the audience with uh, from our conversation today. I, I would just say em- empathy and compassion. Like, I I think we're in a time right now where we left little room for big ideas. Um, I think we left little room for dissenting ideas when somebody doesn't agree with your big idea. And um, and little room for, uh, for conversation. So I just would say being able to be empathetic to other people's ideas, being able to compassionately disagree with somebody and not let that be a judgment on, on their character. Um, and then the last thing, you know, just kind of reiterate, and we got to get back to having fun. Like we got to have, we got to have fun again. It's like life is short. Life is short. Life is short. Like I was, I'm watching this program um, uh, on Netflix. I forgot the name of it, but it's like this guy who like goes back into the, like the ancient civilizations or whatever. And like, you know, pre ice age and like he's showing like um, how Mayan temples that were built pyramids and all of those things, but it's talking about the civilizations. And th- you think about things that were happening 10 thousands and 10 thousands of years ago and now we, you know, we're looking at, you know, um, uh, images from the telescope that's showing us things that happened billions of years ago, right? Our lives are a flash in the pan. They're a flash in the pan, and they're incredibly short. And I had this, um, you know, I, I told you this is a long ass answer to your question, but please. <laughs> Uh, you know, I, 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 I told you, I, I, you know, I, I, I've been I, my gift for myself for my 50th and uh, 50th birthday was um, was therapy and specifically ketamine therapy. And um, and I was in a session today. And um, and so after the session. Um, I was talking to the therapist and I had this real, I, t- I was telling her, I said, well, you know, while I was under, I had this beautiful realization and this gratitude of, um, of all of us going through this journey at the same time. So Austin, you could have been born and existed at any given time throughout this long, long, long stretch of time, billions of years. Me, I could have been born any given time. With the however many people that we interact with in our life on any given day, we got this luxury of being able to exist and overlap within this space at the same exact time. How are we going to use that time? Are we going to use that time to to hate each other, to fight with each other, 
to go to war physically with each other, to go to war emotionally with each other, um, to go to war with ourselves. Like you think about your, your, your very, very early childhood and you think about your later days in life, if you get to live to, you know, in, into your 80s, you really got a, a, a period of probably, let's call it 11 to 12 years old to probably late 70s, mid to late 70s as your lifespan of, you know, to, be, to really, really be able to live. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, what are, what are we gonna do with that time? How are we gonna how are we how are we gonna use that time? It's a beautiful place to end it, Troy. Thank you again. I really sincerely appreciate it. And for everyone listening, uh, thank you again for joining us. And we'll see you next time. Austin, thank you, man. This is dope. Love it. Thanks for listening to this week's edition of One Big Idea. As a thank you, head to onebigidea.xyz to claim your free OG status NFT. We'll be closing off minting after this initial run of episodes, so be sure to grab yours before they are gone. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time.